You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, stocktwits.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the optionsinsider.com. The Options Insider Radio Network is sponsored by Fidelity Investments. Fidelity's Option Trade Builder tool can help you confidently build an options trade in three simple steps. Just choose a strategy, select a contract, and then review the benefits and risks of the trade. Learn more about Option Trade Builder at fidelity.com backslash options. Options trading entails significant risk and is not appropriate for all investors. Certain complex option strategies carry additional risk. Before trading options, contact Fidelity Investments by calling 800-544-5115 to receive a copy of the characteristics and risks of standardized options. Fidelity Brokerage Services, LLC, member NYSC SIPC. It is a dangerous world out there. Volatility is on the rise, and your clients' portfolios are under assault from a growing number of threats. Simple diversification is no longer enough to shield the assets under your protection. Registered investment advisors, financial planners, and asset managers need a new weapon in their war on risk. Welcome to the Advisor's Option, the program designed to arm busy advisors with the information necessary to properly manage risk in this volatile environment. From options education, trading strategies and tips, to industry news and interviews, you'll find it all on the Advisor's Option. The Advisor's Option is brought to you by the Options Industry Council. The OIC was created to educate investors and their financial advisors about the benefits and risks of exchange-traded equity options. For more information on how the OIC can help you implement options in your practice, please visit optionseducation.org. The Advisor's Option is also brought to you by Swan Global Investments. Since 1997, Swan has been the leader in hedged equity and option income strategies with GIPS verified results. Swan provides unique and valuable solutions to the inherent weaknesses of asset allocation, offering defined risk strategies that allow upside participation while also protecting advisors and investors against market risk. For more information about our advisor program for separately managed accounts, Swan defined risk mutual funds, or our proprietary option overlay strategies, please contact Randy Swan at swanglobalinvestments.com. Think outside the style box. Think Swan when deciding on risk management solutions to market risk. The advisor's option is also brought to you by Option Research and Technology Services. ORATS is your source for options backtesting. It's where you turn your ideas into results. Founded on the floor of the SIBO over two decades ago, ORATS is a full-service option research firm focused on helping you develop options strategies in line with your investment objectives. With a state-of-the-art backtesting platform, scanning, and implementation tools, ORATS offers end-to-end option strategy development making the whole options trading process easier. For information about backtesting, scanning, options data, including dividends and earnings, visit ORATS.com or email Matt Amberson at Matt at ORATS.com. The Advisor's Option is also brought to you by Northern Trust Capital Markets, offering a unique blend of transparent trading, quality execution, and smart liquidity solutions across institutional brokerage, transition management, securities lending, and foreign exchange. Northern Trust's options offering includes quiet access to non-traditional pockets of liquidity, 
With hands-on support from experienced traders to customize your trading strategy, combined with the peace of mind that comes with trading through a stable and globally respected firm. To learn more, contact John Cherry at John underscore Cherry, spelled like the fruit, at ntrs.com or visit northerntrust.com slash capital markets. And now, it's time to learn how to implement options in your practice. It's time for the, the Advisor's, Advisor's Option. All right, everybody. Welcome back to the Advisor's Option, the program here on the old network where we help you, the busy financial advisor and asset manager, learn how to wade into those sometimes murky Sometimes it's scary options waters. My name is Mark Longo from the optionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever exciting, at least we hope so, Options Insider Radio Network. And I'm excited to be joined on the program this week by our usual cast of characters. Let's start off. Let's go out in order of distance. Let's go all the way up, out to the East Coast, and then up to a quiet little tranquil area known as New Hampshire. We are joined by Mr. Matt Amberson, the principal and indeed the founder over there at Options Research and Technology Services, a.k.a. ORATS, a.k.a. the keepers of all that great data you guys love so much. Matt, welcome back to the Advisors Option. Hey, Mark. Exciting times uh, and exciting markets. Uh, right in the middle of earnings season, excited to talk about that. And uh, so uh, let's get the show going. Let's get the show going. Let's also move that needle now down the coast a bit and then out, out into the Atlantic to a little island known as Puerto Rico, where we are joined by the magic of telephone <laughs> by Chris Hausman, uh, the portfolio manager and indeed the managing director of risk over there at Swan Global Investments. Mr. Chris, welcome back to the show, sir. Hey, Mark. How's it going? Thanks to... Uh Thanks for being here once again, and I think I owed two congratulations, one from Matt and Mark. This is my third, it's my uh, third uh, three-year anniversary doing this show, and I don't think I've missed one. Is it really? Is it three-year anniversary? Oh, we'll yeah. have to send you a little, three uh, years. A little, next time you come to Chicago, we'll have some stuff, or we'll ship some stuff out to Puerto Rico. I think, I think the mail makes it out that far, does it not? Um, I think so. There's a ship coming every once in a while. Speaking of making that far, I, th I hear Mr. Uh, I hear Mr. Matt is going to be heading your way pretty soon. So a little a little meeting of the advisors' options minds. Don't say too many bad things behind my back while I'm not there. Uh, we'll try not to. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Also joined, pleased to say, in the studio by Mr. John Cherry, the global head of options over there at Northern Trust Capital Markets. John, welcome back to the program. To you as well. Great to be here, Mark. All right, with the gang all assembled, let's dive right on into the buzz. Busy financial advisors don't have time to follow the latest developments from the options market, so we do it for you. It's time to get the buzz. All right, welcome to The Buzz. Like the man said, this is the portion of the show where we break down all the latest developments in the world of options that you may have missed. You guys are busy, after all, managing your clients. They are pretty much a full-time job, so we do it for you. A lot going on in the world of options. Actually, uh, John and I actually ran into each other. We were on a panel together uh, this past week over there at the Securities Traders Association of Chicago Midwinter Meeting. Say that five times fast, where we kind of broke down the evolution of the options audience, which is indeed how we like to look at the options market through the lens of various audiences and talked about many different slices of the options pie, including indeed advisor. So that was kind of fun, bringing a little bit of that information to a traditional securities oriented crowd that maybe wasn't that aware that a lot of advisors were playing in the options space. So that was always very fun. So I'm curious for you, what was your thoughts on our panel, which was entitled The Evolution of the Options Audience? And in particular, I had you there holding down the advisor hot seat. What are your thoughts on how the advisor audience has evolved over the past decade or so? Yeah, so I thought the uh, the panel that we were on, I thought was great. It was a great group of participants. Uh, the, the kind of the overarching theme, even though we talked about the evolution of options, I thought that uh, the audience largely wanted to uh, understand if we we're going to list some crypto options uh, this year in uh, in 2019. Hopefully they're uh, tuning into our crypto show then to, yeah. to find out the answer for that. 
Exactly. Um, you know, as you know, I'm not, I don't think that, I'm not very optimistic that we're going to be seeing that this year. But uh, I thought, you know, again, the panel was great. And I thought uh, being there as Northern, uh, representing Northern Trust Capital Markets was, was great for us. A lot of people came up to me after the panel, like, what's, what's Northern doing here? Did you get a lot of that? Did you, were people surprised to see you at the event? Yes. Uh, so a lot of the, you know, been in the business for 20 years now this year, uh, some faces, you know, recognize some faces in the crowd, uh, some, you know, people that I've known in the industry. So uh, seeing that uh, Northern, you know, I was there representing Northern and, and talking about options was like, hey, you know, you guys are here to play and it's something that uh, uh, you guys are, you know, Northern's taken seriously. And so, you know, at this point, we are about uh, 3% of OCC uh, volume on any given day. Uh, it's not every day, but it's something that, uh, is uh, is grow, a growing volume uh, for us in, in the institutional space, and so I'm um, looking forward to uh, to growing the business more. That's, that's pretty rapid growth. You've been only been doing really what three years? Is, how how old is the options desk over there at Northern? Uh, November of 2015 is when uh, when I joined Northern. Three, three so. years, so you pretty much picked up a percent a year. That's not bad growth, <laughs> and especially given last year was a 5.1 billion record contract year. So you guys are putting up some numbers over there at Northern, sir. Yeah. So uh, on any given uh, on any given day, so we're very active in index ETF and single stock options. Uh, and again, I know I've said it uh, oftentimes on your show, but the, the diverse needs and breadth of our client base is what's kind of driving that demand. If you had to pick the one go to, what's the lion's share of that three percent? Is it your straightforward five percent out of the money SPX put? Is it the opposite? Is it the covered call? What is the lion's share of that 3%? It, it, it really is kind of two main segments, and I'm sure we'll get into it later later in the show, but uh, covered call writing uh, is very, very popular for a lot of our clients, clients that are just looking to add, uh, in, you know, covered call income yield on the on their underlying assets, and then hedging. Hedging is, is very popular for a lot of our clients. If you missed it, and I understand maybe a lot of you weren't able to make it all the way out to Chicago in January. Then we tried to grab some of that audio. Hopefully, that'll be hitting the network for you very soon. But a lot going on in the world these days. Of course, it's our first show here of 2019. The markets have been on quite the topsy-turvy roller coaster period since our last program. You know, December usually a tranquil, a very quiet period, very seasonally calm from a volatility perspective. And we saw effectively the opposite of that. In this past December, of course, we had the market shutdown, an issue that we're all still dealing with, as well as, of course, the lingering issues surrounding the trade war, all that led to pronounced sell-offs, pronounced moves in the market, pronounced volatility. Now, here we are recording this about three weeks into January, so it's about three weeks into the new year, and we're off to the races again for sell-offs and then rallies, and then the trade war may be done and maybe not, so a lot going on. Then on top of that, of course... It's the beginning of the year, which means that the ORATS votes are pretty excited because it's also time to dive back on into the earnings fray. So, Matt, we're kind of just kicking it off. We're kind of just in the early phases of this. So first off, so we haven't had a show in a little while. So if you want to talk about just what you've been seeing in the market for the past month, it has been a very topsy-turvy month. Have at it. And then B, of course, I know you guys are chomping away already, cranking out the earnings move reports. Anything interesting, anything exciting coming across your desk from an earnings volatility perspective? Well, yeah, you, you mentioned the market, and you know, we watch that very closely. We have some proprietary signals that we really like, uh, kind of based on short-term contango, and also one based on a floor, forward flat volatility, kind of a, a measurement that uh, calendar spread traders use, and we're finding that, that um, we could get a good pulse on what the the option market really thinks of the market and we're seeing it mellow out and you know mellow out to the point where it's it's a much different earnings season than last earnings season the last earnings season was was particularly interesting because it was the highest volatility around earnings that we've seen in a long time and and what we saw as a result of that was actually uh, the the people that uh, sold, lost, the people that bought uh, won more than usual. So we, we usually see a 40-60 uh, winners to on the buy and 60% and, uh, losers, um, or I'm sorry, 60% um, of the time when you sell, you win. And that was 45 versus 55. So that was a lot different than usual. Um, and so uh, we're anxious to see what's going to happen at this earnings season. We think it's going to go back to a more normalized, uh, a more normalized type of environment. However, um, that's been 
uh, that hasn't really been shown to be true so far. We've we've actually had uh, the actual moves moving more than uh, than usual. So uh, there's still you know, not very many have reported. Uh, you know, Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, and some other ones have moved a lot more uh, than we uh, or than w was anticipated by the market. Actually, the ORAT signal has been working out pretty well. We have a proprietary signal to, to help identify the stocks that we think will move more or less than um, is valued in the option market. Um, again, it's a it's a longer story. It's on our blog, but we we talk we isolate how much of the straddle is associated with the the current um, option straddle, and then if you do that, it's, it's a lot better uh, of a way to to identify and think about um, where it's been implied historically. And then once you do, once you have the good data, then you can uh, do some good analysis and some good predictive analysis, and we do that. Uh, we do that every earnings season and every day we come out with an earnings report. So, um, you know, it's early days, but uh, it looks actually a little bit more volatile than than we would expect with given the uh, the volatility coming down in the market, Mark. And John, you know, I know maybe traditionally a lot of your clients are, are not playing and maybe as much or maybe they are. I don't know. I'd be curious to hear in the single names, maybe the more index focused. Uh, but I'm curious for you, is earnings season A a big driver of volume for your clients? And if so, B, you know, what are you seeing out there? Yep. So historically, no, I would say no. Earnings is not something that uh, largely our clients participate in. But for our wealth management partners, what we've seen, or clients, not partners, sorry, uh, this year has been, uh, you know, particularly with fourth quarter earnings, I would assume given because of where volatility is at and, and the overall market kind of kind of being, you know, a topic of conversation you know, through the holidays has been an inc a material increase in uh, uh, hedging of client positions uh, through earnings. Yeah, you know, we it's uh, the trade war's on, then it's not, then it's on again, then it's off again, and the market shutdown continues. We see all these global macroeconomic concerns. So it has certainly been a tumultuous period, much more of a rocky, turbulent start to the year than we're typically used to, even though last year, if we look at the numbers, January was actually a very turbulent month, a very high volume month as well. I mean, February gets all the headlines, kind of steals all the thunder, because that's where the worm really turned. But January, people look back to it, was actually a much more rock 'em sock 'em robots type month than a lot of people remember. Chris, obviously you guys have been busy down there in Swan just dealing with and, and trading these very volatile markets. Give us your thoughts on a more volatile, more action packed December than most, as well as a more volatile kickoff to the year than a lot of people expected and, and what's been kind of catching your eye over this past month or so. Yeah, I mean I'll just begin by summing up two thousand eighteen. It was a challenging year for option premium sellers and you know going all the way back to the first quarter of 2018 and the fourth quarter that we just finished up. You know, that was some of the best, those were the two best quarters to actually be long premium since 2011. So needless to say, uh, realized volatility for the most part this year kind of nipped implied volatility a little bit. And uh, anyone selling option premium had to do a lot of navigating and a lot of tap dancing to kind of avoid, you know, what happened uh, earlier in the year and then what happened in the fourth quarter. So, uh, you know, we're going into January with the same type of situation. I mean, the VIX may not be exploding on us right now because we're rallying and if anything, it's coming down right now. But realized volatility uh, remains to be king. So, you know, when you're going through these type of periods where the underlying is moving so much in one way, if it's really best to kind of, you know, it, to sidestep it a little bit, kind of pick your points when you want to come in and sell premium, you know, wait for overbought, oversold type conditions, wait for major support, major resistance areas, uh, because the fact of the matter right now is this blindly option premium selling is being very, very challenged right now, you know, with the kind of moves that we're witnessing. Speaking of challenging, there's this guy, you may have heard of him, Chris, uh, named Randy Swan. You may, may be familiar with him. Uh, he posted an interesting, looks like a little op-ed uh, article there. I think it was over there on Real Clear Markets. This was toward the end of last year, uh, but certainly certainly applicable to what we're talking about right now. Looking back on, you know, obviously everyone, if you listen to a lot of our end of the year shows, you know that October 11th was really the, the key point for a lot of people in the options market, and certainly for the options space. It was the busiest day of the year. Uh, from an options perspective, which eclipsed even the Feb Ocalypse, call it what you will, back on February 5th and 6th of, of last year. So October 11th, the moment where the, the worm really, really turned. And we saw 
return of volatility in February, but the, the long equity bull, really, the claws came out, the bears came out on October 11th, and the volume and the volatility uh, reflected that. So he wrote this a few months into that, kind of looking back on that. We talked about this on this show as well. You know, there's been this general trend towards passive investing. Even still, if you go to a lot of financial advisors right now, they'll say, okay, I'm going to take you. I'm going to put you. Well, how old are you? What's your quote unquote risk tolerance? Okay, 60 40 uh, equities and some fixed income, maybe 70 30 if they're a little bit more aggressive, or maybe if they're super crazy outside of the box, they'll do 60 30 and then a 10 of other, maybe probably gold or something else like that. And they, they consider themselves to have done their due diligence. They did their job on behalf of their clients. They're following the old school. Markowitz portfolio theory from back in the in the 50s that said you had to have a handful of allocations to these different names and you were pretty much fully diversified. But as Randy points out in the article here, you know, even uh, the U.S. aggregate bond index fell more than 1% during the first quarter uh, of 2018. So even these things that you would traditionally look to diversify to weren't really getting the job done over that period as well. So I, I know this is a, a general issue for you guys over there at, at Swan, Chris, and kind of one that comes up again. People out there are looking for income all the time. If you had an income portfolio of about 40% of your portfolio devoted to income, that hasn't really been blowing the doors off of late either. And, and you know, obviously he's an advocate for hedged equity. We kind of tend to like that approach here as well. I'm just curious, Chris, on, on your general thoughts of you know, people still turning towards that old Markowitz era 60-40 split, considering their job done, and maybe maybe some of the efficacy of getting a little bit more active, and perhaps, you know, maybe, who knows, maybe heresy, maybe they go out and they actually hedge a little bit, sir. Yeah, I think one of the problems is, is correlations. I mean, when, when you go into true bear markets, um, all assets correlations tend towards one, and they can go very quickly. I mean, we saw that this last quarter. So, you know, it's really about choosing assets that are not correlated and that are going to provide some type of protection, you know, when bear markets come. So that's, you know, kind of, you know, it's the whole premise of the defined risk strategies over a full market cycle. It's going to protect you during these larger bear markets, uh, you know, not necessarily the 5 and 10 percent corrections that we have continuously because those are just normal pullbacks in bull markets. It's really the bigger bear that erodes, you know, financial wealth over longer periods of time, which is what we try to protect and which, you know, any hedged equity strategy should try to protect. You know, you're right, because obviously you ride the bull up and then you ride the bear back down. At the end of the day, you haven't done too much for yourself. You know, obviously the correlation issue is a big one. Matt, you guys live and breathe by the data over there. What are your thoughts on, as Chris alluded to, the correlation, when it all hits the fan, it all tends to go to one. And maybe looking beyond the, the traditional passive allocation, something a little bit more active. Yeah, I, you know, there's a saying that, uh, you know, all investing is either long ball or, or short ball and, and mostly short ball. And so the only true way to hedge yourself is to get some long ball in your portfolio. I sound like a broken record on the show, but I like to have long ball that relates you know, almost entirely to the portfolio that you have. For most people, it's the S&P. So I beat the drum for just out of the money S&P puts. Of course, those are expensive, so you need to figure out how to finance them. Um, you can finance them you know, a number of different ways, but you know, you have to, as, as Chris alluded to, uh, it's navigating and tap dancing almost. You have to have some type of volatility signals, and they, they are out there. Um, you, can, you have to be uh, very nimble, and you can have a an income producing in order to pay for the out of the money puts that you have. If, and, if, and if they relate, then even if something bad happens when you are uh, a little short, short term near the money, um, it can pay off, you know, by having the, the maybe longer dated uh, out of the money puts in, you know, more of a quantity of them. So what we, what we like to test and what we like to uh, talk about with, with our clients you know, is how to pay for out of the money puts. Having that long volatility is really the only way to protect yourself. And as we've seen, you know, I hate to see people get hurt, but you know, we're we're, we're seeing that that some of the ideas that we've had are are, are coming to roost here. And uh, you know, there are ways to to protect that uh, portfolio, to protect that investment. And it's not just the old kind of 
Harry Mark Woods 6040, it's it's having some long volatility in your in your portfolio. And and that's what we're able to back test. It's what we're able to show. And that's what hopefully we can help uh, pay for with some income producing strategies, Mark. And John, I'm also curious for your thoughts on this question. Obviously, uh, Randy and his team over there, they like a little bit of hedged equity, as you might imagine over there. You know, the point is an interesting one that people have a little bit of maybe short memories and also that we've seen this a lot. You know, what's the drumbeat been in the asset management world for the better part of the last half decade or so? It's been passive, 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 right? So that means they're going to ride the elevator up and they're going to ride it right back down again, probably a lot faster. Uh, so I think Randy's point is an interesting one that people out there, probably a lot of them, even though despite the vol has come back a little bit, are you seeing this maybe with your clients as well, that maybe some of them aren't prepared for the next downturn? Or also maybe as you're talking to them, maybe anecdotally, what are you hearing from them? Are they calling you up saying, hey, we want to get prepared. We want to start hedging. You know, what are you hearing out there anecdotally as they were seeing the vol start to trickle back in? Sure. So I've seen this a few times since being at Northern. Uh, first in, in kind of 2016 leading up to the U.S. election. Uh, there was a lot of questions of, you know, which, which uh, you know, Democratic president would win or Republican president would win and the uncertainty around it. And so hedging, hedging client portfolios was very popular then. And then you had 17, which was very low vol environment. And so there's not much real hedging taking place other than late fourth quarter of 2017, where you saw a lot of inbound inquiries from clients, you know, institutional clients, high net worth individual clients looking to protect portfolios uh, in, in December of 2017. And who knew, you know, a lot of our clients must have had a crystal ball because that uh, event hit fairly early in first quarter of 18, where, uh, you know, we had that, that large volatility spike. Uh, fast forward to kind of today, uh, it, it's kind of a bit more of the same. It's a mixed bag. A lot of clients are, are comfortable with their risk assets that they have uh, on the long side. Uh, and, and there is opportun opportunity to hedge those portfolios accordingly with, uh, you know, put spreads and call spreads, depending if you're short stock. And so uh, it really is just more us being, you know, proactively talking to clients about these type of solutions, uh, both for U.S. domestic uh, uh, exposure and, and international. Well said, sir. You know, it, it's January. It's typically a slow start to the year, so that some of these fun stories tend to percolate up on our radar this time of year. Not that slow right now, but still an interesting story that came across our radar I wanted to just touch on, because we always talk about on this show, you know, how difficult it is to get clients to sit down and talk about options. You know, the dreaded D word, the derivatives. It's scary. They're terrified. They don't want to do it. Well, interesting data coming out of this was the Capital Group uh, saying, uh, forget about just options, just, just getting them to talk about money. They'd rather talk about almost anything else on the planet, including those those subjects that you're always taught are taboo at a dinner party. You know, what, is, what does everyone always say? You know, go to a dinner party, don't bring up politics, don't bring up religion, all of these just typically, typically divisive topics. And yet, according to this study, uh, money blows them all out of the water. Something to keep in mind when you're sitting down with your clients next time. They said, if you're trying to get people to talk about things like retirement savings in particular, Forget about it. Let's see. Just 35% of the people they polled had discussed financial-related topics with friends and peers in the last six months. If you break it down by age, it changes a little bit. 23% for millennials, about twice, almost twice as likely as boomers, just 13% to talk to their friends about money. So boomers, forget about it. They don't want to talk about money to anybody. Women consider financial topics more taboo than men. Uh, if you ask about people to talk about things, which topics they consider to be off limits. So it's a little bit of a counterintuitive methodology, but that's how they did it. So the higher the percentage, the more taboo people viewed it as being. And the highest one there was household earnings. 39% said it's a taboo subject. Forget about it. Won't touch it. Followed hot on its heels by a subject that's near and dear to our hearts here on this show, retirement savings, 38%. So 39% for just the household earnings in general, 38% for retirement savings, debt, 32%. So pretty much all financial stuff all at the top. Inheritance, 25%. You know, the typical thing people tell you not to talk about politics, people have said, sure, we'll talk about that. Only 17% said it was off limits. So less than half who said retirement savings were off limits. Let's get even further down the rabbit hole, a little weirder. You talk about drug use, because who who doesn't do that at a at a dinner party? Why not? Sure. Only 14% said it was off limits. So they 14%, almost 40% say retirement savings, but only 14%. So you talk, let's talk about drug use at a party. Uh, race, probably the most divisive issue of our day. Five times more acceptable to talk about. Just 8% than retirement savings. So just something to keep in mind, something very, it's, it's silly, 
but also it explains a lot about why it's so hard to get people to sit down and talk about this stuff, uh, let alone when you start getting down the rabbit hole, the options. I'm sure if they put options on here, it would be 98% uh, because it doesn't sound like this crowd would be into that, but still <laughs> interesting stuff. It's kind of a silly poll, Matt and or Chris. So if, if you have any thoughts, feel free. But it just it kind of struck me as funny that people would rather talk about these these deeply, deeply divisive... I'm not sure what dinner parties these people are going to. The ones I go to, we certainly don't don't discuss those topics. But hey, you never know. Uh, next time I'm, I'm going to go, I'm going to sit down to the person next to me and say, tell me about your inheritance and or retirement savings, because that's really going to offend them. So I guess that's the moral of the story, Matt. If you want to offend somebody at a dinner party, ask them about their retirement savings. Yeah, Mark, it, it, it's a little sad, actually, to me, because the reason they're not talking about it is they're not in a very good spot. And uh, and when they're not in a very good spot, uh, that's uh, not too great for kind of the society around us, right? You want people to be financially secure, and then they can make better decisions. You know, if if they're uh, not saving and they're in debt, um, they're panicked when some when it goes against them. And and um, you know, I think it's actually quite divisive for society. You have a whole swath of people that aren't saving enough. And don't have enough in retirement, and you know they're they are uh, um, you know in investments that they probably shouldn't be in, and you know you could point to the cause of it. A lot of it's easy money, and there's no there's you know, it's, it's very difficult to you know put get any return in a in a, by savings in a savings institution. So uh, you know I, I I saw that story. I appreciate you bringing it up, and and you know I, that's you know that's how I'm feeling, Mark. I'm feeling you know, just a little bit sad about it. Hopefully, we could turn this around. Well, let's see. I don't know if our next story is any happier, but we'll try. It's an interesting one. It's not really happy or sad. It's more, I think, more just illuminating uh, barons as they want to do. These publications live and die by their lists, and they come out with their list of the top. It's an interesting number: twelve hundred top twelve hundred advisor. That's a that's a huge number. If you're, are you really that excited if you're number 1199? Maybe you are. I don't know. But uh, top 1,200 advisors of 2018. And this is interesting. There's a lot of interesting takeaways from this. You can read the whole thing over there at Barron's. I encourage you to skim, perhaps do the, uh, do the abstract. Uh, but there was a couple of interesting takeaways from this. First off, if you go through, there's a lot of talk of volatility in this list, which is interesting because that's obviously near and dear to our hearts. It's pretty much the theme of the entire piece, volatility, the return of volatility. What does that mean? What does that mean? So you'd think when you see that, that you would assume that a lot of these advisors and asset managers that, that they're including in this would have some sort of wherewithal in the space that we're talking about, which is options. And yet nowhere is that really a pullout or a call out or any sort of talking point about here is that we named this advisor to the top of this region or this area because of their knowledge or experience in this particular arena. Maybe maybe dealing with volatility would be a thing you'd want <laughs> in an era where volatility has returned. And yet it seemed like the takeaway from this was, quote unquote, staying the course. That's what a lot of them were talking about. Or they were talking about dealing with this volatility by adjusting their allocations to things like credit, which we just talked about before. Not perhaps the most effective of ways to diversify your risk. All the kind of standard boiler, boilerplate you would kind of expect from uh, the option space. You think in 2018, the criteria, the evaluations would get a little bit savvier, be a little bit more demanding. Uh, they talk about here that you know the the stock market was on a roller coaster ride throughout all of 2018. The number of one percent moves had matched all of 2017, and that was by February. So we had a rock'em sock'em year, and that people were saying a return of volatility wasn't a big concern. That this guy from uh, this firm says they had very little concern expressed by their clients. A lot of them talked about the return of volatility, saying that volatility is normal. And they had they wanted to spend time explaining about 18 month cycles of no volatility and long term cycles. So a lot of this was getting back to the old beating of the drum of buy and hold, buy and hold, whether the short term volatility for the longer term. Uh, interesting, though, is that there was there seemed to be a subtext to the analysis. You know, for years, we've talked about how just the entire trend has been towards passive, passive, passive. And yet it did seem like there has been a little bit of a comeback, at least in their rankings, for a little bit more actively managed investments. People talking about getting a little bit more active with their ETF selection and things like that. And they even mentioned in the article, in volatile markets, active managers uh, can provide superior performance by picking winners and avoiding losers. Again, a little 10,000 foot, but still, it's a little bit of a nod in perhaps 
the right direction. So yeah, this is interesting stuff. Again, I take these lists, most people take these lists, I think with a big grain of salt, but still maybe a little bit disappointing. You know, Matt and Chris, that we don't see in these rankings criteria that are relevant to a lot of our audience. They looked at things like regulatory records. Again, it's important. You don't want your advisor to, you know, be out there scamming people. They looked at internal company documents, whatever that means, and quote, a hundred plus points of data provided by the advisors themselves. That's an important point. This is self-marketing. People are submitting this stuff to this list. So keep that in mind when you see these lists as well. Sometimes the busy advisor down the street is busy managing his clients, not sending his data <laughs> to parents. But still, that's a conversation uh, for another day. Interesting stuff. I don't know, Matt, does this surprise you at all? Or is this kind of what you expected? Even in 2018, they're not really looking down the rabbit hole that much. They're still looking at surface things like buy and hold, long-term investing, and simple things like we just talked about, simple portfolio diversification being the, the panacea to all of your portfolios, Ilser. Yeah, it's a little worrying that they're not talking at all about options. And we saw the Cirilli study that, that talked about the advisors are a lot more apt to use options if they trade it for themselves and understand it. So it just seems like um, these people aren't either using it themselves or not understanding it. And yeah, I saw that. What caught my eye was, you know, they're talking to their clients about, hey, volatility is good because. Uh, we could actively manage and, and get you in the right securities and, and you know, kind of playing to their book a bit. So um, that's what I came away with. You know, again, um, this is what we're trying to do here on the show is talk about options, talk about how uh, they can provide protection, how they can provide some income and some cushion and in volatile markets be able to, you know, sh make the investment returns that might be sought after by these investors, Mark. Chris, this is obviously a hot topic. It's pretty much the core thesis of this program, getting people to think a little bit more actively, look at things like hedging as alternative ways to deal with volatility rather than just ride the storm up and ride the storm down. What are your thoughts on this list of the top 1,200 advisors, a lot of advisors uh, by Barron's, and the fact that they, even in 2018, a year where volatility came back by their own admission, it's still not really a, a big criteria for how they evaluate these advisors. Well, I, I agree with Matt. I mean, this is a, a perfect environment to, if you're not already involved in options, to start learning more about it, to protect portfolios or, or possibly add income, you know, be tactical out there with different types of strategies. But I, I guess the other takeaway is that, you know, we still have a tremendous amount of work out there to educate people and, and to show them how, you know, options can be used to preserve capital or, or add incremental returns to to portfolios. So, you know, at the end of the day, I agree with what Matt said. And, you know, I think we still have a, a lot of work to do out there with a lot of advisors and to show them, you know, that uh, these, you know, that derivatives options can be a viable part of anybody's portfolio. Well, Matt, you mentioned the uh, Cerulli study earlier. That was one, of course, commissioned by our friends at OIC. Eric and his advisor team, they work with Cerulli doing a lot of analysis of the advisor space, but they've done other analysis of the advisor space outside of the purely options oriented. And we talk to a lot of advisors out there. What's the one thing a lot of them are scared about, right? They're scared about these robots, the so-called robo-advisors coming in and stealing their clients and eating their lunch, so to speak. We've often said that options very much the perfect counterpoint to that because they involve a lot of high touch, high skill, high degree of execution there that the the algorithms out there, the so-called robos can't really replicate yet. So if you want to set yourself apart, not just from the advisor down the street, but from the encroaching on rushing AIs and machines, options are a great way to do that. But Cerulli looking out there trying to perhaps allay the fears of some of the advisors out there. All people also look at big global tech leviathans like Amazon and say, hey, you know, when are they coming into this space? Are they going to eat my lunch with their AWS and their massive economies of scale and all their data aggregation and everything else? At least according to Cerulli, uh, the answer is no. So if you're an advisor, you can maybe take a little bit of a deep, relaxing, calming breath. Uh, so they looked at different data points. And they sh according to the Cerulli data here, only 12% of investors comprise what they term to be the digital advice opportunity segments. Now, so those are people who would be open to really working with a so-called digital advisor like an Amazon or maybe some of the other ones like the Betterments out there and things. Uh, they say that rather limited market segment is one obstacle for potential elements, excuse me, potential entrants from the tech segment. They're saying Amazon's not gonna come in until that size of that market, that potential opportunity gets a lot bigger they also say that's something we talked about on the show many times, 
This is a highly regulated, highly nuanced space. <laughs> and that's not typically an area where tech firms play very well. They like to work in a little bit faster, looser regulatory environment. When we come into a space like the financial space, very tightly regulated, the you know, the the restrictions on what you can do with the data, how long you have to keep it and things, they're very onerous. And so for some of these firms that come from the, shall we say, fast and loose, freewheeling world of big data uh, on the tech side, this space a little bit terrifying, to be quite frank, which is another reason why they cite that they don't think Amazon in particular was the focus of their study, but you can apply this to other firms as well. And of course, there's all the issues that come with making a platform that's secure and robust. How many times have we seen hacks and failures just in recent years? So that is still an issue. The trust factor, still a huge issue out there as well. And of course, they already have access to a lot of this data, but uh, hiring, <laughs> it's funny, you know, even though you have a digital platform, you still need people who are experienced to come in and help man it, and you are gonna get customer inquiries, having people there who can handle that. That's another, ironically, the human aspect is another huge stumbling point for them. They could build this digital platform, having people who are experienced in the RIA space, certainly in our space, the option space, or any others. They're difficult to find, let alone getting them to work for that platform and come over to the dark side so to speak. Uh, so an interesting area there, all these, so maybe this study, again, I encourage you to check it out over there at Ceruli for yourself at C-E-R-U-L-L-I. Maybe it gives a little bit of hope to our audience out there who we know are scared of this stuff. And we talked about it last week on our panel as well, that this is just a, an area where advisors are always kind of looking over their shoulder these days. At least according to this data, Chris, Maybe your average RIA, he could take a little bit of a relaxing breath. Doesn't mean he can go back to just being a 60-40 a guy. He has to be a little bit more advanced than that. But maybe, at least for the time being, Amazon, Google's, insert whatever name you will there in the tech space, they're not coming to eat his lunch, Chris. Yeah, I think there's always going to be a case for active management. And, I mean, one of the things that these venues may not have is the experience that a lot of people have had over the years and, and seen all the different market environments and nuances um, I guess it goes back to that driverless car, right? It's going to go off that cliff that first time. Um, that's going to be very painful, but then it's going to learn. Um, so, you know, do you want to experience that or do you want to hold off or, or go with someone that has already gone through, you know, the different types of market environments over the years and knows what works and what doesn't work? Matt, same question for you, sir. Obviously, you play in the tech space, so you're always keeping an eye on uh, when those Leviathans will make their entrance. It sounds like at least... At least according to this data from Ceruli, the, the segment there still not big enough to be attractive really for the Amazons and the others out there. Yeah, this is an interesting topic. You know, ORATS tries to make systematic strategies and backtest them and take some of the emotion out of it. Uh, but that's a big leap to, then to go from uh, that type of, of, of data and analytics to uh, you know, Amazon or Google. Um, I'm reading this book on surveillance capitalism. And I think it applies here um, how um, one of the biggest uh, market effects uh, is how much data, and we, you know, we don't need to tell anyone that, but they, they own a, of each individual. And now it's getting into even health and what you eat. Um, my wives and daughters track everything on their on their phone, and I know that's going right into someone's database. And you know now we're, we're going to be able to track what, everything that they trade to? So um, is there anything that, that's not safe? Um, but, you know, I think it's, it's a ways off, but I think that there is something to be said for some uh, you know, systematic strategies and the AI, they're, you know, they're, my clients are, are using AI, but they're, you know, you have to get good data. You have to get, um, you know, the, the professionals behind the AI. Um, you know, it's not just... Um, you know, starting it off and, and having some tech guys. You have to have people that know the, the markets, that know options, that know uh, the things that go into the investment sphere before you can make them systematic. But I do think that there is a degree of, of systematic strategies that are coming to to the market, and and advisors are going to have to get you know on board. Uh, uh, you know, the, you mentioned twelve hundred in that last study. You know, I'm kind of new here in uh, Portsmouth, and there there are so many wealth advisors I can't even believe it. So, you know, what are they doing up up in those offices? You know, and can it be automated? And, and what are their margins? You know, I actually ask myself that. Do do, do you know, uh, how could we make some of their job more systematic? But you know, it, 
as Cirilli is saying, it's a ways off. It's too. It's, it's very regulated right now. It's going to be a difficult road to hoe for these uh, financial corporations that already know so much about you. There has to be some pushback somewhere, Mark. Who knew Portsmouth, the new mecca for uh, asset management up there? I'll have to go check it out up there. We'll poll some of your neighboring RIAs, uh, Matt, and see, see if any of them use options. We'll, we'll take an over-under on what we think that percentage will be. Since we're talking AI here, I don't want to get some of your questions on as well, listeners. I know you guys have them backed up. Since we're talking AI, we'll wrap up with this. It's kind of interesting. And more surveys, more studies is coming out of financialplanning.com. On this, again, this topic, very, very top of mind for a lot of advisors out there, particularly some of the newer advisors, younger advisors coming into the space, and they're looking at how they're going to deal with this broad technological future. Matt mentioned, of course, AI and machine learning. That's a big area of development for a lot of these platforms, including the aforementioned Amazon. Amazon seemingly the boogeyman for just about every industry these days. Everyone's looking at Amazon coming at them over your shoulder, whether you're in the organic hummus market like Whole Foods or whether you're in wealth management, Amazon. Looking over your shoulder at Amazon all the time. In fact, recently, according to this article here, Amazon, they pitched their, obviously everyone knows Amazon Alexa. They went out there and pitched the, the AI underpinning the Alexa system to the wirehouses and broker dealers out there in the financial management space and the robo advisors. So maybe contrary to what Cerulli says, maybe this will scare you a little bit more. I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't have ended with this one to scare you guys, but we'll still, it seems like there is hope there though. They did a poll here. This comes out of source media as well. Uh, they asked people, which, which robo advisor, if they're using one, which kind of one are they using right now? And overall, will technology replace human advisors and out there, apparently, if they're using Betterment out there, they say 28% of them say yes. If they're using other platforms, Betterment was the biggest one by far, actually, by the way, 15%. Obviously, if you're on Betterment, you're already kind of halfway there anyway, so maybe you think the future will be mostly robotic. Uh, then it gets drops from there, 15% for Schwab, 9% uh, for Vanguard, and so on and so forth. And again, this kind of the crux of this research as well is still that even though there are a lot of these robotic platforms and they can do a lot of things and, and AI and machine learning are really picking up the pace of their evolution. Still, the human factor is kind of a limiting factor. They don't have the expertise. They don't have a lot of these things that clients still need. And clients really, really still need a lot of that high touch element to their services that the robots simply can't provide. So that's still kind of an interesting, interesting cornerstone there on Curry. I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. The page is called Young Advisors Grappling with a Digital Future. But speaking of grappling, it's time for us to grapple with some of your hard-hitting options, questions. Beginning of the year, they're starting to pile up. We got to get you guys cranking through there. So it's time to open up the office hours. It's time to answer your pressing questions about options. It's time to start our office hours. You can become a part of this segment by leaving a question on theoptionsinsider.com, emailing us at questions at theoptionsinsider.com, or via social media at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash theoptionsinsider, or stocktwits.com slash optionsinsider. All right, everybody, welcome to the office hours. This is where we hang out our shingle, not unlike the myriad of advisors who live down the street from Matt there in New Hampshire. And we attempt to answer your deep, intricate, complicated options questions. So let's kick things off. This one's, this one's got your name written all over it, Mr. Director of Risk. This comes from Levitt. Levitt wants to know, he says, is the two-year leap put approach replicable in an equity account for smaller size accounts. I ask because I'm looking at doing it with SPY versus SPX and probably rolling around the one year point. Is there anything that I should look out for? So obviously, Chris, this guy's been inspired by what you guys do out there in the DRS. Obviously, you guys do it in SPX. He's looking to do it in SPY, but it sounds like effectively a somewhat similar approach going out hedging a couple of years out, again, not an approach we, we see from our audience very often, so that's why I, I assume he's been inspired uh, by you guys. What are your thoughts of doing something like, like something like this with a smaller account? First off, if there are any maybe caveats you should be aware of. Secondly, obviously you guys like SPX for the institutional type size and a lot of the tax treatments, so obviously that's a, that's a downside for SPY, but other than that, maybe also be doing it with SPY. And then maybe if you have any, any tips in general for someone looking to try their hand 
at uh, hedging themselves before maybe they graduate something like a DRS? What should they be looking out for? Well, you can absolutely do it on smaller accounts. I mean, we manage a lot of SMAs that are, you know, on the smaller end compared to the institutional accounts that are about 100,000. But you can even go smaller and just trade one lots and two lots if you wanted to. So um, I mean, you're right. A lot of people don't go out in the further term space for hedging. Um, so we kind of rent that one-year option. And one of the reasons is because of the decreased beta or time decay in that option. So that's kind of, um, you know, one of the attractive, the attractions of, of, of hedging in that area. Now, you know, with every attraction, there's also some type of pitfall, right? And we don't get that fast gamma from these 5 and 10% corrections that a lot of the shorter-term hedging um, programs do. But the other caveat is if you are in short-term hedging uh, and your house does go on fire and you need insurance at the worst possible time or the hurricane's about to hit you, it could be very, very expensive. So we kind of you know, we're always going to be, you know, always invested, always hedge. That's our motto. And we're not going to try to time short-term hedging events, um, you know, which characteristically are surrounded by these, you know, these violent 5 and 10% corrections that we have. Matt, you guys are the keepers of the data. I, I feel bad because you always get homework whenever you come on this show. <laughs> but uh, I have a feeling you may already be, be trying to backtest this approach. What do you have to say here for our friend, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Levitt, they want to do two-year puts in SPY, sir. When you mentioned that, Mark, I uh, went off and ran a, a quick back test. Um, and, you know, what we found is is that, you know, sometimes the exiting of, of the position isn't always the, the best uh, strategy, at least from a back testing perspective. Um, and, you know, I have to do some further research because there aren't that many trades out there. And then we have the staggering. So I didn't have enough time to run the staggering trade. But, um, you know, I would I would uh, pass this advice along. You know, look at look at a back test. It's not always uh, getting in the two year and getting out at the one year. It seems like you're avoiding some of the, you know, theta and decay. But that doesn't always uh, doesn't always work from a you know, systematic strategies. And, and what you might want to think about are, are uh, rolling when the, the market uh, looks uh, favorable for those, uh, for those puts. So that, that's about as far into it as I could get on, on this question. But, um, you know, don't always assume that, that exiting is, is always the best way, Mark. Yeah, getting, putting it on is one thing. Taking it off is, is another challenge in and of itself. And, you know, Chris, he doesn't mention here, but I'm, I'm assuming he was going to look at doing this. He's going to want to, to think about something along these lines. But obviously just going out and buying leap puts by itself without doing anything else, that can get fairly expensive over time. And you mentioned you, know, you kind of saved some of that theta over there. So I'm assuming, Chris, this guy's going to want to perhaps look into augmenting this with some maybe nearer term income components, maybe a covered call type thing if he's comfortable perhaps selling his spy at that level or maybe maybe doing a put spread instead of a put. You know, what what would you recommend to him on that side of the fence, sir? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a drag to any type of hedging program. And like, you know, Matt said previously, you want to be able to, you know, if you have an income program, you want to have some baby units somewhere to protect that risk and, and maybe vice versa. If, if you have a hedging program, you want to be collecting some type of premium uh, to overcome those costs. So it really depends on the type of risk. Well, I, you know, the first thing I would say is, you know what, sit down and figure out what your risk threshold is. What is your overall objective? And then you can decide, you know, what am I trying to hedge? Am I trying to hedge out, you know, a 10% down move over the next month? Am I trying to hedge out something greater than 20% over the next year? Um, and, you know, what is your risk tolerance? And that's going to give you your answer. I mean, because your options are a beautiful thing, right? You can pick where you want to, you know, what portion of your portfolio do you want to hedge out? And, and that's going to give you your answer. But I think the first thing everybody needs to do is, all right, you know, where are my pain thresholds? What is my overall objective? And that's going to give you your answer. And, yes, as far as the, trying to produce some income, you can put that. That will lead you to, okay, maybe I do need a put spread and I don't need an outright leap. Or maybe I can combine, you know, some longer-term protection with some shorter-term protection. So, um, you know, that's the thing, you know, using back testing. First of all, define what you're trying to do here, right, your objective, which means you have to understand your risk. And then incorporating some back testing and all these tools so that you can create what kind of portfolio or what kind of, um, you know, risk matrix that you are comfortable with, you know, because at the end of the day, it is your money and, and you're trying to do the best that possible thing, you know, given your objectives. But the hardest thing people have is just defining what their objective is. Indeed. So there you go, Levitt. Hopefully we, we set you on the right course with some 
ideas there, but it does does require a little bit of effort, a little bit of work on your part. Uh, since we're talking income, let's tackle this one here from Andrew. Andrew Lineker, He's, he says, I focus my clients on stocks with a high dividend yield. I think you and a lot of other RIAs out there, Andrew. Uh, he goes on to write, does it make sense to incorporate a covered call component on top of that to increase the overall yield of the portfolio? Well, the short answer is probably going to be yes, longer, but the answer is obviously much longer than that. You know, obviously, we've talked about this on the show many times. You know, you could create your own dividend income stream. You don't have to wait for the stock to pay you a dividend. You could f- choose stocks that you like and create a dividend income stream on them using income strategies like the covered call, for example. If you're curious about that, I encourage you, again, go check out the archives of this program. We have many episodes devoted to those income generation type strategies. But in general, there are a couple of caveats you're going to want to know about if you are indeed writing calls on very dividend heavy type stocks. The first one, Matt, maybe we'll walk them through the fact that, you know, there's no free lunch out there at the end of the day, right? So the call owners don't get the dividend. So if you're writing covered calls out on a stock where there is a heavy dividend, the stock's going to look a little bit more favorable. So maybe maybe walk him through some of the things he should be aware of from maybe from a pricing perspective, if he's out there trying to harvest the old risk premium in these stocks, sir. Right. And, you know, we've done quite a bit of back testing on this. So, um, you know, some of the results that, that we've seen are, are, are very interesting, I think. And, and, yeah, you bring up a good point, uh, Mark, that, you know, those dividends are priced into the options and, you know, you're not going to get uh, as much premium out there. But uh, still, what we found in our testing is, is um, you don't want to give up the appreciation. Uh, the appreciation, you know, even though you have a high, di- you know, dividend stock, if the market's going up, you still need to keep up. And so, um, you know, what we've been finding is just the the more out of the money um, calls, and there are also things that you want to avoid. Um, we've we've done tests um, where um, avoiding these uh, investor conferences and conferences where where uh, firms are presenting often. Uh, are getting a big pop, and that's you know some of the tests that we've done have incorporated you know, avoiding conferences, i.e., not having a, a, a short call on while a conference is going on. Uh, earnings uh, can can cut both ways, um, and then you know also we have there are some techniques to look at stocks that have had some gap moves recently and, and avoid those. So there's there's a lot of nuance to this question. And again, um, you know, in order for you to compete with everyone else out there, I suggest you you, you do some testing on some of these uh, strategies, uh, including uh, selling calls on dividends. Um, and and you could then see, you know, what your strategy is and start, you know, have a strategy uh, that, that is a little bit more nuanced is, is kind of what we've been finding in our in our testing, Mark. All right, and John, uh, for Andrew's question here, I'm sure covered call writing, as you mentioned at the top of the show, probably near and dear to your hearts, a lot of what you guys do over there at Northern. What do you have to say for Andrew here, who's maybe looking to juice up his already high dividend stocks with some covered calls on top of them? Yeah, I think, uh, Andrew, this is a no-brainer. Um, it's something that a lot of our clients uh, look for within their portfolios. Uh, anything again from institutional clients to high net worth individuals. Um, you have you know long stock portfolio, uh, and you, you, that's that's high dividend yield. And I assume you know it's single to uh, high digit uh, percentages. And overlaying that with a, co- a tactical covered call program can easily bring that in this day and age to a low double digit yield. Uh, certainly something that you should uh, you should be considering. Uh, the other thing that I, I talk to clients about um, often is if I am a, you know, anytime I'm looking to sell stock and I'm patient to do so, selling a short, shorter dated covered call that's, you know, at the money or slightly out of the money is a great way to pick up uh pick up some uh, premium income and get a sign. Great. If you don't, you're, you're picking up free money. Mr. Chris, same question for you, uh, Charlie here. Not Charlie, I'm sorry, Andrew. He, he really wants to get into the, the covered call game or the income game, I should say, on top of his dividend income portfolio. He wants to have his cake and eat it too, Chris. What would you, what would you say to him? Yeah, I think the other nuance you have to be aware of, and, and Matt already mentioned, you know, aside from the option already pricing in the dividend, uh, the volatility 
the implied volatility of options on dividend-paying stocks in general, right, so I'm just making a general case here, tend to be lower than non-dividend-paying non stocks. So, you know, not only, you know, is, is the option pricing in, you know, the ex-dividend date and what happens to the stock during that time frame, um, you're going to have a general tendency where there's lower volatility on dividend-paying stocks. So, um, so that's just another thing you have to be aware of when you're, when you're trying to go into this type of strategy. Yeah, all this a long way around here, Andrew, to let us, telling you that you're probably not going to get a huge amount of premium, a lot of bang for your buck when you're out there selling these covered calls. So just bear that in mind when you're out there. Maybe it might be, behoove you not to sell them, but the risk reward simply isn't there. So definitely do your due diligence while you're looking at those. Okay, guys, we have time for one more. We did a couple tactical, strategic ones. Let's dial it back with a little bit more of a, uh, of a 10,000 foot theoretical slash fun one maybe i'll give you guys a choice of two charlie wants to know the weirdest thing we've seen in the options market and uh, sylvester wants to know if we have a silver bullet for getting advisors into options so which one do you guys want to tackle i'll let you guys pick your overwhelming silence is overwhelming Sil silver bullet mark silver bullet okay I, I was gonna say weirdest oh well there you go <laughs> see that's why i don't let you guys pick because you're all over the place all right tell you what we'll do a combo question we'll, we'll make everybody happy we'll make charlie and we'll make it's a hard question because it's a two-parter. <laughs> I'll give you guys time to think. I'll go first. Charlie C. wants to know, he has a quick question for the show. Spoiler alert, Charlie, it's not that quick of a question. It's a hard question. He wants to know, what's the weirdest thing you've seen in the options market? Uh, there's a lot of things. You know, there's obviously a recency bias for us that come to mind. So a lot of things recently, this last year, February, and of course, the big turn in October and the crazy tumult, you know, the end of the year, a usually a very seasonally quiet time from a volatility perspective. And yet we saw unprecedented things like a trade war with our massive trading partner and a government shutdown at the same time. So all these things kind of working into seeing a volatility going up. The first year BXX actually closed up in its entire history, really, <laughs> of actually as a tradable product. So all those are kind of weird. But maybe in recent years, I'll have to look back. Personally, in my own perspective, it was the time when I was still trading and market making out in Intel and they pre-announced bad guidance in the quarter. You know, back in the go-go dot-com days, that was a no-no. So the stock got annihilated and the volatility, the explosions, the trading, it was just madness. And that was still, to me, one of the one of the craziest, weirdest things I had to deal with out there. Also a fun one as well. Maybe in recent history, I think the extended, protracted malaise that was volatility in 2017, the fact that we got down to single digits in the VIX, and despite the fact that we had a lot of turbulent developments in the global macroeconomic environment, nothing could seem to budge that needle until February of 2018. That's when the worm finally turns. So I would say that. And uh, that was a long way around to buying you guys some time so you guys can do a combo before I come up with my second answer for the question. So we'll start, we'll go the other way. We'll start with Chris, because he made us do both. Uh, what, do you, what do you have to say for Charlie C. and Sylvester? I think the weirdest thing for me, because it was early on in my career, was when long-term capital management um, went through their challenges, if you want to call it that, uh, when I pretty much had first started on the floor. So I definitely remember the volatility and the craziness that was going on in the pits at that time. Uh, as far as trying to get more advisors and options, you know, my question, you know, what is an advisor trying to do for their client, right? They're trying to provide the best risk-adjusted return for clients, and options can do that. So again, uh, advisors do need to get out there and learn how they can use options to both hedge and produce additional income for their clients' portfolios. Matt, same question for you, sir. Combo question. Blame Chris. Don't blame me. Mr. Three-Year Man. He made us answer both. What do you, what do you have to say for Charlie and Sylvester? Well, uh, by far the weirdest thing I've ever seen was when I, ha I was backing traders and I had a trader in the U United Airlines pit uh, in the days before 9-11. So, I mean, uh, I wanted to avoid saying that, but, um, you, you know, they were buying all kinds of, of puts way, way out of the money. And, you know, usually what will happen when when there's insider trading is the exchanges will go to the SEC and the SEC will look and, and sometimes you get relief. But in this case, uh, it, it, you know, there are even some papers that are done by academics. Uh, Dr. J. John Jerrion did a paper that showed that there was pre-knowledge of it. So that was definitely the weirdest thing. And, and still, you know, from a conspiracy theorist, you know, kind of really uh, rankles me. Um, so, um, and a silver bullet that would get more advisors into options, you know, I think it's, it, it, here's the way to do it. One, you start using options information for, um, 
to in your stock trading. So, you know, some people use VIX to, to uh, and then some moving averages and such. You know, ORATS has a bunch that you could uh, download by going to our site and, and getting our access to our, our data API. Like I said, Contango, put call slope, the market width. There's a lot of things that you could look at um, for advisors to start using it, especially the, the advisors that use technical analysis in their, tra in their trading or their advising. So I think that's the first step. And then the second step is once you start to understand those relationships, then you could start to, to trade around it in your own accounts. So, and then once you start to feel comfortable trading in your own accounts, hopefully back testing it, and then, then that's when you uh, are feel comfortable enough to give, uh, give this advice out to your clients. So th those are your two answers, Mark. Good ones. You know, 9-11 is the one people bring up a lot. I was I was fortunate in that sense. That I had like a month or so off between I had closed out my positions and kind of sold them back and to start new ones. And that month happened to coincide with 9-11. So I missed, well, thankfully, for, it was positionally, it was, I know it was very damaging for a lot of people. That just shows sometimes luck. <laughs> luck can play a big factor in uh, in surviving various uh, various because it rolled through expiration which was unprecedented and all the front month protection and hedges you may have had went away and all of a sudden you had all these crazy naked deltas and it was a uh, it was a crazy time for a lot of people out there so that certainly is another one out there the silver bullet you know it, it's the 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 cheese ball answer is education. I won't go down that route because that's a hard road. It's a lot of heavy lifting to do to really get a lot of advisors up to speed when it comes to options. Uh, but in general, that's the way uh, I would probably lean. And probably also, I mean, I've mentioned it before, I think beating the drum more about how options are really this, not, uh, maybe silver bullet is the term. They are the silver bullet to the encroachment of the robo-advisors. If you want to really stand up to that and offer an alternative for your clients to those services, options are the perfect silver bullet. There you go. I said it again for those encroaching robos out there. So I think beating that drum a little bit more, I think, might go a long way to luring people. If you tell them that this is the this is the way to defend themselves against their one thing that keeps them up at night, <laughs> then that might indeed be a be a great thing for them. All right, that's going to do it. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for this episode of the Advisors Option. I want to thank all of you for emailing us, sending all those great questions. Those were fantastic. We have many more. Maybe we'll do another great office hours extravaganza in the near future. But before we go, let me go back around the horn. Let's start in the land of Puerto Rico, where Matt will be soon. Mr. Chris, what's cooking in the land of Swan? And when can we expect another 10th box event coming to our neighborhood, sir? Well, we're in the process of finalizing the schedule for the 10th box, so we'll, uh, you can definitely go to our website, uh, 10thbox.com, and get further information about all that. But we do have one major exciting announcement. We just recently launched a new mutual fund called the Swan Defined Risk Growth Fund. The ticker is S-D-A-I-X. Uh, it invests in cap-weighted S&P 500 ETFs in addition to the core components of the DRSs via downside hedge, option income, and this fund has an additional upside beta kicker to increase capture rates during bull markets. Upside beta kicker. I like the sound of that. You can check it out for yourselves out there, listeners. Ticker symbol S-D-A-I-X for the Swan Defined Risk Growth Fund Class 1 shares out there. And while you're at it, of course, head on over to swanglobalinvestments.com. A lot of great content over there, the blog, the newsletter, even some episodes of a show I like to like, I like called The Advisor's Option. You can check it out there as well. And of course, our friends over there at OIC are gallivanting hither and yon. Eric was in town actually last week. I got a chance to talk, see him. He does exist. He still lives. Uh, but unfortunately, his travel schedule doesn't seem to be able to allow him to join us on the program. We'll get him back on again one of these days. In the meantime, though, check him out and his work and his team's work over there at optionseducation.org. Click on the advisors tab and you're off to the races with all those studies, all that great data. Speaking of data, Matt, you guys over there at ORATS are the keepers of the great options data. So people want to learn more, where should they go, what should they do, and what's coming out of the pike from you guys over there at ORAT, sir? Yeah, first of all, congratulations to Chris on, on the new fund and also the three years. Uh, that's a great accomplishment. The three years is really is really the milestone there, you know. that That's really the achievement. And I, I look forward to having a silver bullet uh, down in Puerto Rico. How's that for a tie-in? And I was just thinking while you were saying that, I, I bought warrants. I used to love warrants when I first started trading stocks that I didn't have that much money in my uh, little account that I uh, funded with uh, 
paper delivery. I was a delivery boy, and I was I like to invest in warrants. I was thinking, well, that's basically an option, right? So um, that might be a, a something for for the advisors to think about. But anyway, back to your question. Yeah, we have a new site, Mark, as do you, uh, orats.com. Uh, the blog is is more active. Uh, go check it out. Um, and also, you know, you could, like I said, I, I, I really think the, the way to start getting into options is to, to start using option information even in your stock trading. I think there's a lot of great uh, potential there. And so go over to orats.com or c- contact me at matt, M-A-T-T, at orats.com, Mark. I like the new site. Looking at it right now, sir. Very, very spiffy. Check it out, orats.com, O R A T S. Dot com. Give them a follow on Twitter while you're at it, at Option Rats. And last but not least, John, if people want to learn more about what you and the team over there at Northern Trust Capital Markets are doing, particularly when it comes to options, where should they go? What should they do? Uh, NorthernTrust.com. Uh, and uh, feel free to reach out to me directly, John Cherry at John underscore Cherry at NTRS.com. All right. And on behalf of Matt and Chris and Eric, who couldn't join us, and John and indeed myself, I want to thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, subscribing, sending in great questions, all the fun stuff that you do. Keep it coming, and we'll see you next time for more of the Advisor's Option. Advisor's Option is brought to you by the Options Industry Council. The OIC was created to educate investors and their financial advisors about the benefits and risks of exchange-traded equity options. For more information on how the OIC can help you implement options in your practice, please visit optionseducation.org. The Advisor's Option is also brought to you by Swan Global Investments. Since 1997, Swan has been the leader in hedged equity and option income strategies with GIPS verified results. Swan provides unique and valuable solutions to the inherent weaknesses of asset allocation, offering defined risk strategies that allow upside participation while also protecting advisors and investors against market risk. For more information about our advisor program for separately managed accounts, Swan Defined Risk Mutual Funds, or our proprietary option overlay strategies, please contact Randy Swan at swanglobalinvestments.com. Think outside the style box. Think Swan when deciding on risk management solutions to market risk. The Advisor's Option is also brought to you by Option Research and Technology Services. ORATS is your source for options backtesting. It's where you turn your ideas into results. Founded on the floor of the SIBO over two decades ago, ORATS is a full-service option research firm focused on helping you develop options strategies in line with your investment objectives. With a state-of-the-art backtesting platform, scanning, and implementation tools, ORATS offers end-to-end option strategy development, making the whole options trading process easier. For information about backtesting, scanning, options data, including dividends, and earnings, visit ORATS.com or email Matt Amberson at Matt at ORATS.com. The Advisor's Option is also brought to you by Northern Trust Capital Markets, offering a unique blend of transparent trading, quality execution, and smart liquidity solutions across institutional brokerage, transition management, securities lending, and foreign exchange. Northern Trust's options offering includes quiet access to non-traditional pockets of liquidity with hands-on support from experienced traders to customize your trading strategy, combined with the peace of mind that comes Comes with trading through a stable and globally respected firm. To learn more, contact John Cherry at John underscore Cherry, spelled like the fruit, at ntrs.com or visit northerntrust.com slash capital markets. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice.
Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash theoptionsinsider, or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com. 